in the word this morning. Jonah chapter one. I've been out of practice. I was kind of excited to preach today. I hadn't got to preach in a little bit. Um, Jonah chapter one. I want to talk about free to live on purpose. We've been doing a little series called Free Indeed, and um, I just want to talk about free to live on purpose. And so we're going to be in the book of Jonah. So if you're unfamiliar with your Bible, if you actually have a, like a Bible like this, if you'll start, if you'll find Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament, and work toward the front, you'll get there faster than if you start in Genesis. I'm trying to help you out a little bit. Then uh, it's just right in that little vicinity. Um, and, and our goal, especially this week, is that we live on purpose. Um, you know, one really neat thing that happened yesterday is our very own Lyon County Lions. Come on, from the state championship. And um, one of the coaches, uh, he hasn't gotten back yet, but is Coach Tom. You can put a picture of Coach Tom up there. So this is Coach Tom. And, uh, and if, you, if you've ever seen Coach Tom, he always sits back here, you know, usually behind me and Becky in that little area over there. And he is a worshiper. He's always smiling like that. But uh, you see his, his shirt, um, and he, he's... he's um, put this in the kids, like, like this is, we're going to bring glory to God. This is our year. We're going to bring glory to God. No matter what happens, we're going to bring glory to God. So I want you to see, after they won the championship, just a short two-minute or so clip interview um, with the Lyon County players, and they bring up past, uh, uh, Coach Tom. I call him Pastor Tom today because he pastored the, the team, right? So watch this. Tell us the story of the Brinks. Are they Brinks? Uh, yeah, so our strength coach, Coach Tom Royakers, has been, you know, he's been with us forever, and he's, uh, he's good about keeping us, keeping us in the gym, but more importantly, keeping us level-headed, and, um, you know, I've said many times, there's, there's a lot bigger things than basketball, life is a lot bigger than basketball, and so, uh, I don't know which one's which, but one of them is seven, and one of them is G to G, so the seven, we do everything in sets of seven, um, the, the last number, we do our push-ups, our core workout every day in seven, because that's, that's God's number, so that's, we try to honor, and then the G to G is glory to God. That's something we always try to, to keep in perspective. And, you know, we're, we're very blessed as a team, as individuals, um, even off the basketball court, we're really blessed. Um, and so I think it's important that we use our platform and also just, just recognize every day that, that we wouldn't be anywhere without God, without his favor. Um, so, yeah, he, he keeps that in our heads every day. He's, he's yelling it at us. We, we, get, we can get off the set of core if we can answer a hard question from the Bible. Um, so just stuff like that is, I think, you know, I think it's been really important to get us here. Like, it, I feel like we're we're really in tune with that, and um, and he knows how important it is. And I think we're starting to understand it a little bit as well. Cool. That's that's what I mean about living on purpose. Is you know, Coach Tom said, you know what, I'm going to help these boys play basketball and get stronger and all that, but I want them to know that there's bigger things than basketball, and, uh, and that though that is a part of our life, or maybe a part of our life, but the bigger purpose is to live to the glory of God. And, um, and so this week, I really want us to live with this mission, to live on purpose, and I'm going to challenge us today to get outside of our comfort zone this week and to focus on God's call, right? We're going to choose God's call over our comfort. All right, everybody? Amen, pastor. That's a good word right there. I know. All right, all right. I know I've been gone for a little bit, but uh, uh, going to prime the pump here. All right. Um, so Jonah 1, let's read this. We're just going to read the first uh, six, six verses. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. And he went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. 
And the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Um, the little book of Jonah is, a, is an interesting book. It's a, it's a short book. You can read it. If you just say, I want to read a book of the Bible, it'd be a great one to read. It's only four chapters long. Uh, you can read it in one setting and your, just your devotional time, you know, less than 30 minutes, you can read this book. Um, but it's a story about God's compassion, uh, about his patience, his kindness, uh, his, his kindness toward wicked people. Um, uh, the, the, the Ninevites was, the, the Bible calls them a wicked group of people. Um, it was a city, a large city, especially for that time. Uh, the Bible says they had 120,000 people. Now, some say, well, that, that doesn't count women and children. It could have been 600,000. But the Bible says 120,000. So when you live in Princeton or Eddyville or Dawson, 120,000, that's big, right? So we'll, we'll just use that number. But 120,000 people, it was a great city. It was an important city. Actually, the capital of the Assyrians um, the problem with this story, when you're reading the Old Testament, is it's, these weren't God's people. Um, most of the Old Testament is about the nation of Israel. It's uh, God's dealing with the tribes of Israel and his people. And in fact, there are some places in the Bible where God tells his people, I want you to go and I want you to take out the Assyrians. I want you to wipe them out. And so, you know, if it wasn't for the book of Jonah, we would think that like that's who God is. He's a God who just, you know, when he sees wicked people, he just says, well, just kill them. Just take them out. And you can easily get that perspective of God. But God placed this little book in the Bible to show us that's not his character. That's not his nature. In fact, that God's heart is for all people, even wicked people. That, that's his heart. You, uh, we, we know that Israel was the apple of God's eye, but he, he loves everyone. And the reality is our God does not delight in punishing people. Um, in, in fact, he wants people everywhere to be saved. Let me show you a New Testament passage. New, uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 says, um, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants what? All people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, uh, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for who? All people. Y'all know the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? He loved the whole world. And he says, and this has now been witnessed to, to, uh, to at the proper time. And for this purpose, everybody say purpose. For this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. This is the apostle Paul. And I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And I'm a true and faithful teacher of the, the Gentiles. The Gentiles, again, were the enemy. They were the ones who were against them. He says, but God loves everybody. And he, his purpose is to reach everybody. And so he called me. And he ultimately called all of us to reach all people. And what we learn from the book of Jonah and really, the story of the whole Bible is that people are God's priority. Um, that's God's priority. And so as a church, how many know if it's God's priority, it better be our priority, right? He's concerned about the ones who aren't here yet. And so I know in the last few weeks, we've been focusing on freedom. And didn't Don Sims just knock it out of the park last week? I mean, what a, what a word. And and it was really focused on you. It was focused on how you can find freedom. And that's awesome. That's one of our values. That's what we want to do. It's part of our mission. But we never can lose the sight that the main thing, we have to keep the main thing, the main thing, that people are God's priority. And God cares about people, uh, even wicked people. And he goes to great lengths to rescue them. And really, that's the story of the book of Jonah. And um, and honestly, if you read the book of Jonah, we're going to look at this, but that's what Jonah had a problem with. He had a problem with the fact that God loves wicked people. And, um, and they were so wicked, he didn't think they were worthy of being saved. Now listen, he had a kind of a, I mean, you put yourself in Jonah's shoes. The Assyrians, the Ninevites were, were Assyrians. They, they did awful things to God's people. 
When they, would, when they would win in a battle, they would cut their hands off. They would put them on poles. They would burn them. They would, they would embarrass them. I mean, they were wicked people. Um, and, and, and they were so wicked, he just didn't think they were worthy of being saved. And I think most of us believe when we read John three sixteen, we all said, you know, God so loved the world. We believe that God so loved the world, but, does, you know, but there has to be exceptions to that. Um, I mean, it's there, I know God loves the world, but have you ever met someone who was so wicked, so evil that you thought, you know what, they really don't deserve it. In fact, you kind of hope they don't get saved because you, you want them to be punished. You think they deserve judgment, not, not mercy. Um, we could, we could name some names, but we won't this morning, but it's, um, and, and, and Jonah says, look, I don't want to witness, the reason he's running in the opposite direction, God says go to Nineveh, he runs the opposite direction. The reason he's running in the opposite direction is he says, God, I don't wanna witness to them because I know you, I know how you are. You're merciful, you're kind, and you're compassionate, and you're just gonna let them off the hook. And I just don't think I like that. Um, But that's our God. And he wants that message to get out to people. I think, you know, Easter week, um, you know what the last physical miracle Jesus did before he went to the cross? Um, Is he healed a guy's ear. And not just any guy, it was a soldier who was coming to arrest him. If you remember the story, Peter took a sword and cut the guy's ear off. And Jesus, I don't know if he picks up the ear or he just creates a new one, I don't know. But he heals his ear. And it was like Jesus was saying, look, look, guys, I, I've been with you for three and a half years. I, I'm, he's been with them 33, but he'd been with the disciples for three and a half. And he's like, this can't be the last message. We don't, we don't cut our en- enemy's ears off. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican or whatever. We don't cut people's ears off, right? We, 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 we love our enemies. And so his last thing he did was to heal his enemy's ear. We need to understand that's, that's who our God is. And Jonah had, honestly, had a problem with that. Um, in fact, look at this. Jonah 3, um, in chapter 3, Jonah, he eventually goes to Nineveh. Spoiler alert. He goes to Nineveh. He does preach to them. And listen, the whole city turns to God. 120,000 people get saved. Um, it's an incredible thing. It, it, it even when the king heard the message that, that they needed to repent, um, the, the king takes off his royal robes. He puts on sackcloth, and, and which was a sign of humility. And all the people put them. They even put sackcloth on their animals. Come on, how many know you're repenting when you're making your animals like all y'all? I mean, the, the, the Bible says the animals fasted. Come on, I mean, the, the dog is like, no, you're not getting nothing today. If I got to fast, you got to fast. And you see these dogs running around with little sackcloth sweaters on. I mean, it's, I mean, the whole city's repenting. And, and Jonah is so honest. And look at Jonah 3.10. It says, um, when God saw that they, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. See, he, he didn't want to destroy them. He, he wanted to save them. And he says, look, I've, I've you know, even, even somebody mentioned to me before church about the flood, you know, when God said, look, I'm about to destroy this earth. Did you know that Noah preached for year after year after year? He, he warned them. He didn't want to send the flood. If y'all would just repent, but they wouldn't repent. And the same thing, but Nineveh did. And by the way, just, just a side note, um, repentance is part of the gospel. Repentance means to, it's a change of mind that leads in a change of direction, that, that God said that I realize God is good and he's compassionate. I believe that he, he sent his son to die on a cross for me. And I, I not only have to believe that in my head, but I have to turn from my sin and turn to him. And that's, that's, what, that's what they did. They turned to God and... And it's amazing is Jonah's response. It, it would have been neat. I mean, Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. Okay, that's, keep that in mind. Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. He could have stopped, if God had to let him, he could have stopped at the end of chapter 3 and just said, and they all got saved. And that would have been it. But then he writes chapter 4, 
which says this. It says, but to Jonah, now realize, Jonah's the one writing this about himself. But to, but to Jonah, it seemed very wrong, and he became angry that they got saved. And he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. I knew that you're slow to anger and you're abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Man, look at how upset he was. God, I knew it. I knew you were merciful. I knew you are full of compassion. He just didn't think that they were worthy of salvation. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you, do you know of anyone who's worse than you? <laughs> You're like, this is a trick question. <laughs> ah. have, you, have you ever heard somebody say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm, what they're saying is I'm not as bad as that guy. I mean, I, I'm not perfect, but what they're saying is I think I'm good enough. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, let's all just admit it. I'm pretty good. I mean, that's, that's what you're thinking. And so, so, and Satan would love to get us in that frame of mind where we're thinking of getting us feeling superior to other people. I mean, this is the guy that we skipped this part, but y'all know about the whale, right? That his, his disobedience ultimately got him in the belly of a whale for three days or a fish. The Bible doesn't say well, big fish. Um, gets in the belly of a big fish for three days. And by the way, people will say, well, that's impossible. You, a person can't live in the belly of a fish for three days. Exactly. You'll also read in your Bible, it says, God prepared a fish. It wasn't just any fish. It was one God prepared. So just like he prepared a whole earth. And, and all, so, so anyway, it, it's God, if God wants to prepare a fish that somebody can live in for three days... Can we all agree that God is capable of doing that? And, and so, he, so, so the guy who rebelled against God spent three days in the belly of a well, and then ultimately after three days, I don't know about you guys, but I would have started praying on day one, but on the day three, he's like, you know, I probably should pray. That guy was looking down on those people, and that's what this religious spirit will do when we, we look at others and think, well, I, I, I want grace, but, you know. And that's what Satan would love. He'd love, us, he'd love to get us feeling superior and to look down on others and how lost they are. In fact, he would love for us to have no interaction with those people, right? I don't like those people. And sometimes we just need to stop and remember how lost we would be without Jesus. Come on, we're not so hot ourselves, right? Um, imagine your life without Jesus. Uh, when I was growing up in the church I grew up in, Mike York's mom used to sing a song. She, it was called Remind Me, Dear Lord. And it, I'm not going to sing it, I promise. But it was uh, roll back the curtains of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I would or could have been. And, um, and it's this, you know, every now and then we just stop and say, you know what, there but for the grace of God. Right there but for the grace of God. And Jonah just didn't realize how lost he was. And so God, after he's, you know, like, I knew you were like this, God. I, I just, I'd, I'd rather just die. Just go ahead and take me out. And, and the Lord replied to Jonah. I love his question. He said, is it right for you to be angry? Great question. Is it, is it right? In other words, if you know I'm compassionate and you know I'm full of mercy, if you know I'm loving and kind, the reason you know that is because that's how I've been with you. And the reality is, God, we, we want God to be that way with us and my family and my kids, but we want judgment for them. Right, And so we have, to, we have to be careful of that, and we have to remember that people aren't the enemy, they're victims of the enemy. That people are the way they are for a reason, and it's because the enemy has had his way. In fact, the Bible, in, in, uh, Jonah ends the, 
the end of uh, chapter 4, it, it, God says, look, um, the Ninevites don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know their right hand from their left. They don't know what they're doing. Sh- shouldn't I be concerned about them? In fact, that's a great question. Look at the way he ends it, Jonah 4.11. Should I not have concern for this great city of... He's trying to reason with Jonah. Shouldn't I care about them? I mean, there's 120,000 people there who don't know their right hand from their left. How can I not care about them? It's a great question for us this morning. Should I not have concern for Princeton, Kentucky? Should we not have concern for Eddyville and Western Kentucky? Or let's, let's, it's, it's easier for us to love them. Should I, we not have concern for, for Russia and Mexico, Japan? And so today I'm going to challenge us to live on mission, to fulfill God's purpose. And, and listen, it starts with our hearts. Everybody say, it starts with my heart. And, and Jonah reveals to us he had a heart problem. His, his heart wasn't like God's heart. But here's, here's the reality. God chooses to work through faulty people. He, do, he does. I don't know why God does it, but he chooses to work through faulty people to reach other people. And, and again, I, what I love about this, and it just really hit me this week, is that he's the, the author of this book. And, and I don't know if I was writing a book called Troy that God told me to write, I might put a couple good qualities. I mean, I did this wrong, but, you know, I was, I was a good husband or, you know, I tried to be a good father. He paints no positive picture of himself at all. He says, let me tell you about Jonah and myself. I was a hard-headed, hard-headed, uh, hard-hearted, hard-headed prophet, rebellious against God, and I didn't like those people. And at the end of the book, I still didn't like them. In fact, I wanted to, I'd rather die than to see them saved. And that's what he said about himself. He says, but God, on the other hand, whoo, he's compassionate, and he's full of grace, and he's kind. And he, here's what he does. He's very transparent about his own weaknesses, and he highlights God's goodness. Well, can I tell you, that's a great witnessing strategy, is, is to say, let, let me, I, I'm, I'm a mess, but my God's really good. I remember years ago, I was working construction, and, and uh, I was a general contractor, and I had a lot of subs, and these guys, I saw them every single day and working with them, and it was, it was all business. You know, we were doing business, you know, we were working and trying to get a job done, and, you know, I'd be three or four weeks into the job, and they knew I was a Christian, they knew I was a believer, but I hadn't shared, I hadn't witnessed to them. I hadn't shared my faith. And it, I'd always feel guilty, because here I've been, I've known them all this time, and I hadn't shared my faith. And God convicted me of that. And so, so, so sometimes I'd get with a guy and, and I'd get in his truck. And I remember one guy, I got in his truck with him. And I said, I just want to apologize to you. I said, we've worked together all this time and I've never shared my faith with you. And you know, I'm a believer, but um, I don't know that you know what that means. And would it, would it be okay if I, would, I could share my faith with you? It would make me feel better. That's what I'd say. It'd make me feel better. And they're like, well, if it makes you feel better, you know, <laughs> Go ahead. And so I'd, I'd tell them about, I'd like, listen, my life was a mess, still a mess, but my life was a mess. And I'd tell them about all the things, all the ways I'd messed up and all the things. That I, I said, but God rescued me and God changed me and he saved me. And he'll do the same for you. And I'd be like, you, you, you want to receive Jesus? And they're like, not yet. I remember that. Not, not yet, but I appreciate you telling me. And I'm like, okay. I was so happy. I was, I mean, I mean, I would have preferred he got saved, but I was just thankful that I did it. <laughs> I did it. I told somebody, you know, about Jesus. And it, it's this picture that, that Jonah says, look, I'm a mess, but God's really good. Can I tell you, that's a great way to talk to people about God. Hey, you know me. You can talk, talk to people, you know, you know me, you know I'm a mess, but can I tell you about God? Because he's really, really good. And Jonah I mean, Jonah does not do a good job, but 120,000 people got saved. I can just see him. I mean, you know his heart, you know his attitude. I can see him walking. And the Bible says he walked, Nineveh was so big, it took him three days to get through the city. And and his message was basically, y'all got 40 days to change your ways. You know, preachers have to do alliteration. You got 40 days to change your ways. 
and if you repent, God will relent. You know, he's, he's doing this, and, and, and I can just see him. He's like, he's like, and let me tell you something. I don't think he should do it. I think all y'all should go to hell. I mean, that's what he was, that's the way he felt, but God's good, and if you'll turn, he'll save you. I know he will. And that message, that message saved a whole city. So God uses imperfect people, and if he can use Jen, the beauty of the book of Jonah is God is good, Jonah's a mess, and if he can use Jonah, he can use anybody. Amen? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, if he can use Jonah, he can use you. There you go. Um, Look at Jonah 1 again. Look at at these first three verses. The word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh, that great city. Preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And Jonah ran away from the Lord. I told you the end of the story. He, He ultimately goes. But at the beginning, he runs away from the Lord. He heads in the opposite direction and sailed for Tarshish. So God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. He goes the opposite direction. I want you to see this map just so you see what what he did. So he is in Jerusalem, which is over here by Joppa. Joppa is a seaport city. And so he goes from Jerusalem to, to Joppa. And instead of going 500 miles to Nineveh, he says, I'm going to Tarshish, which is like Spain, which is like the farthest thing he could, in his mind, 2,500 miles away. I'm going to get away from this. And, and before, we, before we look down on Jonah for not going, how do you know we all have a command to go? God's asked all of us to go. And so before we do some Jonah bashing today. Just keep that in mind. God calls all of us to go. And when he doesn't go in the right direction, God sends a storm. God prepared a wind, the Bible said. Just like God prepared a fish, he prepared a wind. And and the wind turned into a storm, and that storm was affecting others. See, when when we aren't doing what God calls us to do, God is very intent on getting us on track, right? And so he'll, he'll send a storm oftentimes into our life. And ultimately, to get the storm to stop, they actually threw him overboard, and that's where the fish comes in. Here's what I want you to see, is that God is willing to make us uncomfortable to get us on board with his mission. He's, he, wants to, he, he wants to get us out of our comfort zone to be concerned about what he's concerned about. He's concerned about people. And Jonah prioritized his own comfort over people. I know, you'd, I know this is a holy church. Y'all would never do that. You would never prioritize your own comfort over other people, but, but Jonah did that. Um, in fact, this is an interesting story in chapter 4. After Jonah went to Nineveh and he did preach and they turned to God, um, he went up and sit on a hill and he was just mad. And the sun was shining. He was hot. He kind of put a little umbrella over his head and he's just sweating. He's mad and he's, he's watching. He's just looking at the city of Nineveh and he just saw them all repent. And he's just kind of still hoping like, God, well, maybe God will still wipe them out. Just like, God, please just wipe them out. Maybe it wasn't real. Maybe that was a jailhouse confession. Maybe they didn't really mean it. They just didn't want to get smoked. God, take them out. And he's hoping God will change his mind. And so God wants to show his heart. And so God prepares, again, God prepares a tree, a little, a little some kind of leafy tree to just all of a sudden grow up out of the ground. And it provided like this shade tree. Just, just like that, just out of the ground, Jonah's hot, and this tree comes up out of the ground, and, and he's sitting in its shade, and look at verse 6, it says, the Lord provided this leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort, and notice this, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. He's like, oh yeah, now we're talking, now this is good, this is good. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. 
And the worm chewed the plant so that it wintered, withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. How many love it when God provides? He's Jehovah Jireh, right? We love it when he pays the bills, but how about those scorching east winds that God provides? No, what's he doing? He's trying to get his attention. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head. He's, he's sunburned. His lips are chapped. He's faint. And notice again, he wants to die and said, it'd be better for me to die than to live. You see, what God is trying to show him and what, what, what Jonah is revealing about himself is, look, I, I, I valued comfort more than I did God's call. I, I, I was more concerned about my own comfort than I was what God wanted to do. And and so there are times that God will send storms into our lives or worms into our lives to get our attention and say, hey, 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 I need you to focus on what I'm focused on. There's other times God will send blessings into our lives, like the shade tree. That was a blessing. And God say, look how I've blessed you. I had a, had a couple come to me recently and said, we, we, realize, we, just, you know, we realize that God has blessed our business and, but we've been focusing on that business being about us, and we realize we, we believe God wants, he blessed us to be a blessing. We want to use our business as a blessing to other people. And, and so God wants to get our attention. I want you to live. I'm not just blessing you for you. I want to bless you for, so you can be a blessing to others. And the reality is God wants to get us out of our comfort zone and be concerned what he's concerned about. And, and we all battle choosing comfort over the call um, just, just this week, um, I, um, we, we've got some really good friends that were founding members of our church, some of our best friends, my son's best friend, many of you know, uh, Todd Huddleston, um, fell for stories and, um, and still in Tampa, Florida. And so they called, I was talking with Rob, his dad, on Tuesday, and he said, I, I think Todd's going to get home, uh, he's going to get released tomorrow, that was Wednesday. But we can't, the, the ambulance ride, they're, they're not going to provide an ambulance for him to get back. And uh, they, they said he doesn't have injuries that would, which is good. They say he doesn't have to have an ambulance. But it's still, it's a long way from Tampa, Florida to Nashville is where we're trying to get him to. And uh, so he said, do you think we could get an RV or something to get him back? So I tried to find an RV in Tampa that would go one way to Nashville. And that didn't work. And so it was, you know, we're trying to make all this happen on Tuesday because we're thinking he's getting released Wednesday morning. And so I, I'm, I'm so busy, y'all. I mean, I'd been, I'd just been in Florida for a week. And so I'm back. Easter's coming. I, I know y'all know that. And, and so I'm trying to get a hundred things done. I'm on a tractor out here, you know, trying to get the grass ready and, 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 and just doing a hundred things and, and thinking we need to get an RV from Nashville to Tampa to pick him up. And so Rick Bowles is like, I'll go, I'll go. Uh, but you know, that's probably two people need to go so somebody else can drive. He just, I said, we'll find somebody, you know, we'll, we'll take care of the RV. Just make it happen. He calls me back a couple hours later. Well, I got the RV, but I don't have anybody that can go. And, and, and Becky's like, Troy, you should go. You should go. And, uh, and I'm thinking, well, you should go. You know, <laughs> no, no, I'm like, well, how about that? But no, I was, uh, um, and, and so, you know, it wasn't like it was, see, see, the longer you serve Jesus, you realize it's not about choosing between to sin or not sin. It's like, you got two good things. It's like, I got a lot of stuff I need to do here at the church, but then I've got people to minister to down here. And, and so which, which one's right? It's not good or bad. It's good or God, you know, it's like, they're both, they're both good. And, and so long story short, I'm like, next thing you know, and, and I'm headed to Nashville to get in an RV. And I just want you to know, this is way outside my comfort zone. I've never driven an RV in my life. And I'm picturing this, like, I'm about to be driving a 32-foot RV through Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. So you can see why I might not want to do this, everybody. And, and, then, and then the other thing, I'm going to go to a, a guy that's in a hospital. And I was just down there last week, and when I walked into his room, and he's hooked up to tubes, and they started explaining about what happened and what they're going to do, I had to leave the room, and I'm about to pass out over in the corner. I mean, the dad, Rob, is coming over to me. Troy, you're going to be all right. And I'm like, no, no. 
You know, I got, got people ministering to me when the guy's in the ICU. You know what I'm saying? And so you're sending me? Y'all see the humor in this? And, and, and so God is stretching me. So the next thing you know, I've got this baptism of fire. I, I, I'm driving an RV and, I gotta, and I'm looking at this thing and the mirrors are like five foot wide. And, and I'm like, I got a semi on each side. I'm just like, help me, Jesus. You know, and I'm just... <laughs> It'll help your prayer life, I say that. And, 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 and Rick Bowles is an absolute hero. He's still down there. Um, but, but what I'm saying is God has a purpose and a plan, and it often involves us getting outside our comfort zone. I'm so glad I went. In fact, I think I put a picture in here. Um, yeah, so there's Todd O and Rob, his dad, and me and Rick down there. And, uh, and you know, we're, we're praying, believing for a full recovery. He's walking, talking, God's moving. You know, let's, let's give God praise for that. Um, but I just want to remind us that God's purpose is people. And he's called us all to go, go to the world. And he's more concerned about his purpose than he is our comfort. And so my challenge to us this morning is to choose the call over comfort. And listen, I, I, I'll be, I'm, I'm a realist. I know you're probably not going to do that every day for the rest of your life. You're going to have days when it's about you. It's about your family. I get it. But can we at least, can we this week, this week, I'm just challenging you one week to live on mission, to slow down when you're walking through Walmart. I know if you're like me, my goal is to get out, in and out, as fast as I can. I'm on a mission, in and out. I'm asking you this week, slow down. See people, listen to people, talk to people, pray with people. If you've ever been on a mission trip, you know what it is, you get in this frame of mind like the minute you get in the van and you hit the hot, you're in the frame of mind that says, it's not about me. It's not about my comfort. I, I, I know this week I'm probably not going to get to sleep in the best hotels. I'm not going on vacation. I'm going on mission. And so I'm probably not going to eat my favorite food and I'm not going to sleep in the best bed. But it's not about me. It's about people. And then even when you get to the airport, you're already thinking mission. You're already witnessing to people in the airport before you ever get to where you're going. I remember years ago, we took a short-term mission trip to the St. Louis Dream Center. It was convenient because it was only a few hours away, and, and uh, we get there, and I've got this little team and, and, and some ladies and some, some young people and me, and, and, and we get there, and, and uh, we're going to serve people for a week. And I remember the very first night we're there, this young guy, he's 20-something college graduate, just out of college, and he's like, I just want you guys to know, I'm so excited you're here. You get to serve in one of the roughest neighborhoods, one of the deadliest zip codes in the whole United States. And, and we're just looking at each other and like, did, did he just say the deadliest zip code? And it's just it's me and some ladies, and Bryce was like 20, and, and, and uh, my son, and, and it's like, oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But we were on mission and we slept in bunk beds and we washed dishes and we served people. And then, and then the, on Friday, we went and cleaned up a, a, a block in the hood with broken glass. And we, we, we mowed the grass and cleaned up, uh, uh, mowed the grass. We were mowing the glass, really. It was just glass flying everywhere. And we were cleaning up this lot and we brought it out and put inflatables up and we cooked hot dogs and, and then we went around the hood and, and we started knocking on doors. And, and you know, when you're on a mission trip, you think crazy. We're, we're knocking on the doors of crack houses like, hey, y'all need Jesus real bad. And, and like, we got a block party down here. And my son's out in the street, like handing hot dogs, stopping cars, like stopping traffic. Hey, come on, we're having a block party for Jesus. And y'all know how dumb that is. But you kind of feel like we're on mission. And that's what I want you, this week, I'm asking you to, to live on Jesus, to see people. The call over comfort, come on, invite them to the revival this week at Butler. They got, they got five chances. Hey, can you come Monday night? No, I'm busy Monday. How about Tuesday? No. What are you doing Wednesday night? Be a good night. How about Thursday? How about Friday? No, I work every night. 
All right, what are you doing Saturday morning? We're having a big block party at Butler Lawn. Come out, bring your kids. You got inflatables, have a hot dog. We prayed over it, it'll be healthy. It's blessed, right? It's, it, it's living on mission. Hey, hey, can you come to church on Easter with me? I'd love for you to come. We've got two services, nine and 11. Which one would be better for you? It's not about us. Every other Sunday is about you. This one is about the one who's not here yet. Amen? And the reality is people are looking for what we have. In fact, if Becky comes, worship team gets ready. Look at this, Jonah 1.4. It says that when this wind was happening and the storm was coming, that all the sailors on the ship, they started crying out to their gods. And they started throwing their stuff overboard. How many know when things get bad enough, material things just don't matter much? And, 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 and yet, where was Jonah? He was, he was sleeping in the middle of the storm, and, and the sailors went down and said, what's wrong with you, man? Wake up and call on your God. How many know it's bad when you're getting rebuked by the world? And, they're, and, and it's like they're saying, don't you see the mess we're in? Get up and call on your God and see if he might just save us. And honestly, I believe as I was reading that this week, I, I felt like it was a prophetic word for the church that, that our world is, 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 is in the midst of one storm after another, and they've tried everything that they know to try, and, and they're looking for someone, and it's like they're looking for someone who has the answer, and the church oftentimes is, here we are, we have the answer, and we're asleep in the storm. And I feel like people are, the world is saying, how can you sleep? Come on, get up and call on your God. Take notice of them. People are as hungry as I've ever seen before. They just don't know what they're hungry for. And they've seen the things over the last several years, they've seen the things they put their hope in, that those things will let them down. And they've been let down by politicians. Come on, how many of you have seen that? Oh, if we can just get this one in. And then you realize this, four years later, we're still in a mess. They've been let down by their corporations. They've been let down by loved ones, even been let down by the church. Let down by their sports teams. Not Lyon County, obviously, but there's another team in Kentucky. I mean, a lot of hopes and dreams were shattered this week. The dreams of another Final Four appearance were up in flames. And I watched the game in frustration as UK gets beat by Oakland. I mean, for real. And, uh, and as soon as the game was over, people started texting me, y'all okay? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. Um, because here's the thing, it's, it's what the Lyon County ball team said. It, it, there's, there's bigger things than basketball, everybody. And I enjoy watching UK play basketball, but that's for my entertainment, that's not my purpose. And at the end of the day, I, I, I shrugged my shoulders and I, I went to bed, my life doesn't resolve around it and it's over. Because here, I'm not gonna let my joy be determined by whether a 19 year old kid is having a good day on the basketball court. I was watching one of them who's always great and he was just having a terrible night. And I'm, I said, I wonder if he broke up with his girlfriend last night. I mean, you know, cause that's a 19 year old problem, right? Are you gonna tie your joy to whether 19 year olds are having a good day? Or are you gonna tie your joy and your purpose to Jesus who loved you and is solid and, 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 and will always, in the midst of a storm, he is the rock that you can tie to who's immovable and unshakable and, and who's always there and who will never let you down. 
I love the old hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking stand. See, the people on the ship were looking for answers and Jonah was sleeping. Come on, everybody, it's time to wake up. When Jonah woke up and he told him about his God, do you know all the ship, everybody, all the sailors on the ship got saved and turned to his God? And then he goes to Nineveh and they all get saved? Come on, God's way is really, really good. And so I want to challenge you this week to remember the goodness of God and to share it with others. Come on, if you'd stand to your feet, I want us to pray four things this morning. Um, Again, it starts with our heart. And so here's the, the first thing I want us to pray is, God, change my heart. Change my heart. Help me to love people the way that you love people. You know, we can walk in obedience to God, but still not have his heart. You can be doing what God tells you. Like Jonah, he did what God told him to do, but his heart never got right. And say, God, change my heart. The second one is, God, open my eyes. God, that as I go throughout my day, I'll see people and I'll see what you're doing. And, and I won't just see the tunnel vision of what I'm trying to do, but God, I'll see those around me. The third one is, God, open my ears. Lord, that I can hear you and that I can hear the cry of others like the men on the ship who were who were worried and Jonah was oblivious. God, would you give us ears to hear? And then the, the last one is the one I need the most help with. God, give me courage to open my mouth, to invite people to come, to tell people about Jesus. Come on, isn't that a good prayer? Would y'all pray that with me today? Father God, we come to you today, Lord, and we ask that you would change our heart. Give us your heart for people even those people, the ones that we normally walk away from, God, would you give us a heart to move toward them? God, we pray that you'd give us your eyes to see. Give us your ears to hear them and open our mouths. Give us courage to open our mouths that we can share the message. Listen, if you're here today and you've never experienced the compassion of God, I want you to know how much he loves you and the great lengths he goes to save you and that he loved you so much that he sent his only son and, and went a lot farther than from Jerusalem to Nineveh. He came from heaven to earth and, and lived a perfect life and lived here for 33 years and lived the life that you or I that we couldn't live and then he went to a cross and died the death that we should have died in our place. And he took all of your sin and my sin and, and put it upon himself on Jesus and he paid the price. And he says that if we'll believe in him, that we can have everlasting life. And not only will he forgive us all of our sin, but he'll adopt us into his family. And he will remember your sin no more. He's a good God, he's a compassionate God, but, but he said, well, she said what, what do I have to do? You just repent, you turn from your sin like the Ninevites did call on Jesus and ask him to save you and he will or maybe you're here today and you need a fresh start and even like Jonah you you've been running from God and you know God had a purpose for your life he's got a plan for your life and you've been resisting that and you found yourself in one storm after another storm and and you're tired of running and you just want to you want to surrender to Jesus today and have a fresh start in your life if any of those things apply to you this morning, would you just lift your hands? I just wanna pray for you this morning. Just lift your hands, amen, amen, amen. Come on, just keep your hands up. Father God, you see every person, you know every heart. God, we thank you that you're the God not only of second chances, but all oh, that you never give up. That you don't enjoy punishing or sending storms, but you love to, you love to rescue, you love to you love fresh starts, and Lord, I pray that each one today will have a fresh start with you as they commit their lives to you, Lord.
Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Can we worship the Lord one more time today? This song is a... Um, um, the song's a prayer song. Come on, let's pray this to the Lord today.